Okay, so should we go ahead and, and start having a head start? Everybody's comfortable with us taking a head start. Great. Okay, so then um, this next session is uh, um, a lecture style session, which is um, called Working with 3D Medical Images. And uh, what we're going to do is just briefly talk about the types of uh, image analysis problems that ITK SNAP is suitable for, um, and then talk a more specifically about how we represent medical images in the program, um, the structure of layers, the concept of layers in ITK SNAP, and um, also talk about a little bit about image formats, um, image data, and metadata. And all of these concepts are kind of important to uh, have a better grasp of things that happen in SNAP as you use it. So we'll talk about <coughs> segmentation, ITK SNAP, and medical images and image files. So um, as probably all of you know, since you're interested in ITK SNAP, the segmentation is a way of labeling some things of interest in your images. Um, so in other words, separating something that you want to measure or you want to uh, represent uh, quantitatively from everything else in an image. And very broadly speaking, uh, in medical imaging, there are kind of two styles of segmentation. One, which is uh, sort of more commonly called tissue classification, where you sort of want to label all different tissue types in an image, um, versus another kind of segmentation where you're interested in a specific anatomical structure, or specific lesion, specific tumor in the data. Uh, and so ITK SNAP is suited for the second kind of problem. So it's not, it's not a tissue classification tool. It's more focused on where you have, uh, you know, like the hippocampus in this picture, something that you want to segment um, where it's not just distinguished from everything else by uh, having a certain intensity profile. And um, there are, you know, different types of segmentation algorithms. There are quite a few methods that are fully automatic. And uh, I think the first stop if you have a segmentation problem is to check out if there are dedicated fully automatic methods for your problem. Um, and there are a few, you know, very targeted methods, all fully automatic methods. There are a few more generic fully automatic methods like multi-atlas segmentation that's very effective for a lot of uh, anatomical structures. So ITK SNAP doesn't do that. It's not in a fully automatic world. Um, ITK SNAP handles semi-automatic and manual segmentation. And these techniques um, are useful when the segmentation problem is too difficult for an automatic method or, you know, the performance of the automatic method is not reliable enough. Um, Sometimes, you know, you, you start with a fully automatic method, but you want to correct something on a s set of individual images. And this is where ITK SNAP comes in useful. Um, and it supports, of course, completely manual segmentation. He's okay. He's, he's helping out. Um, and um, so we'll talk about the semi-automatic segmentation in a couple hours. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the general design philosophy of ITK SNAP. So, you know, there are many, many, many uh, free image processing tools out there, and uh, a lot of them have a much bigger development team and much bigger budget than uh, ITK SNAP has. And so, what what sort of distinguishes us um, check in, um, is um, that. ITK SNAP is really, from the beginning, has been focused on the problem of image segmentation. So uh, it was not meant to be like a big Swiss Army knife type tool that combines all kinds of different algorithms and um, tries to do everything. It's more, it's really, the idea is users need to label something in an image, give them a tool that's fairly easy to use and um, fairly reliable and has an um, easy 
user interface. So there's a lot of focus on the user interface. I mean, in developing this tool, we spent probably 80 percent of the time worrying about the user interface and 20 percent of the time about functionality. Um, and we try to limit the amount of new features that creep into the tool. Uh, although lately we have been adding new features, but we still try to make sure that they are focused on a uh, segmentation problem. Um, a little bit of, of just numbers about ITK Snap. So um, it's been at least 14 years of development uh, in different stages. It started out as a student project um, at uh, UNC Chapel Hill under Guido Garrick. Um, I've been working on it for about 10 years. Um, it's, uh, it has a quite a number of uh, users and downloads. Of course, we never know how many users we really have because we don't charge uh, for the use, but you know, we can gauge it by the numbers of downloads and numbers of citations. And um, it has, uh, we, we've had uh, uh, some support from NIH, uh, most recently with an R1 grant, which uh, is funding uh, ongoing work to improve uh, the tool, modify the user interface completely, um, and make it support uh, multi-channel, uh, multi-modality image uh, data in the automatic segmentation pipeline. So I'll show a little bit of the new tool um, at the end of the course. Uh, originally, we had hoped that the whole class is going to be about the new tool, but it's not there yet. So we're hoping to have it ready by the end of the year uh, for production. So um, next, uh, I'll talk about how we represent medical images in general, and specifically how in ITK SNAP we represent medical images. So um, again, probably this is something that everybody knows. You know, medical images come from scanners. The scanner takes some sort of physical measurements, uh, reconstructs them into a data array, and stores it in an image file. And so ITK Snap doesn't really know what happens in this world. It only looks at the image file and what it can infer about the image. Uh, by looking at its contents, and its contents, uh, most of the content is the data, the, the values, uh, the intensities in the image, but there's um, some important metadata in the image as well. And um, so ITK Snap treats an image that it loads it as a three dimensional array of voxels. So it doesn't handle well ultrasound cone data because it doesn't really understand cones, it just thinks. Something as a three-dimensional array, that's what an image is. Of course, you could represent that cone as a three-dimensional array of voxels, but basically it's a, it's a block of bricks. That's what ITK Snap sees. It sees a block of bricks. And every brick has a, has a single intensity value, single numerical value, which is the intensity of that location. So that, that's how ITK Snap thinks about images. Um, so, of course, uh, as humans, in order to visualize these uh, uh, blocks of data, we need to somehow turn them into pictures. And sort of the two most uh, broadly used approaches is to either slice the volume, in other words, take some kind of arbitrary slice through a volume, and a slice through a three-dimensional volume. It's a two-dimensional uh, image that we can, we can view, and there are various volume rendering or surface rendering type techniques that let us look at whatever is in the image as if it was a physical object in front of us. So in ITK Snap, we mostly work with this slicing approach. So in the ITK Snap main window, we always are going to see three slices, and these slices are taken in three orthogonal cut planes through the image volume. So they're always at 90 degrees. And as a user, we can manipulate which slice we see. And we'll talk a little bit later about the 3D cursor, which is basically a representation of where, where these three slices intersect. So metadata. Um, 
along with this brick of voxels in an image, there's a whole bunch of additional information. Of course, the metadata has been in the news lately quite a bit. Um, so, you know, just uh, throw it out there. So, what, what type of uh, information do you think image metadata is going to, to contain? Just, does anybody want to throw out one? Walter? Voxel size. Voxel size and anything. What else? What other information do we need to, to know to relate that array of voxels to some kind of physical space? Transformation matrix. Transformation matrix, right? There's a three-dimensional transformation matrix between the image and the space from which it, the image was acquired. Um, so those of you that just came in, if you could um, make your way to the front desk and sign in, please. Just over there. Um, anything that doesn't involve geometry, is there any kind of metadata that doesn't involve geometry? Scaling. Grayscale levels. Gray levels, that's true. So the range of how, how the numbers relate to um, some kind of physical measurements, etc. So we also could have subject information in some image formats. So who was it that we scanned? Uh, scanning parameters as well. Um, representation of how the image is actually stored on disk. And uh, what Walters and others said, spatial extent, orientation, physical meaning of intensity. So, of course, in a computer, this three-dimensional array is going to be represented as a one-dimensional array. And the metadata tells us how to put this one-dimensional array back together into three-dimensional array and then how to put it into patient space. So here's something. Uh, whenever we work with 3D medical imaging, uh, that we have to pay careful, careful attention to. And that's the meaning of sort of coordinates. So, so we have this natural kind of um, voxel coordinate space where we could say that, you know, the x-coordinate goes along the columns in this 3D array, the y-coordinate goes along the rows, and the z-coordinate goes along the slices. Um, so it's a way of indexing into this three-dimensional array. And so we, we think of this as a voxel coordinate space. So voxel coordinate space is just a way of indexing through the three dimensions of the imaging data. But every one of these voxels also has a location in physical space. So physical space, which is defined relative to whatever device it is that produced the, the image. And there, um, the x, y, and z coordinates have a physical meaning. It's, it's, it's really a, a location relative to some reference coordinate frame, to some origin defined in the scanner space, and some x, y, z coordinate defined in the scanner space. And so this information, uh, in, in order to work with images, um, almost or very frequently we need to have this information. We need to un understand this transformation from uh, from voxel coordinate space, which is indices, to a physical coordinate space, which is physical locations. And um, so we'll, we'll come back to this uh, in a second. But <coughs> first, let's talk a little bit about image file formats. So there are a number of uh, standard image file formats that are, that are used uh, in the industry and in research. And um, you know, they have different advantages and disadvantages. They have different uses. Uh, they have different uh, amounts of metadata that they represent. And uh, they also, you know, represent metadata in different ways. So um, the most standard is DICOM format. This is the industry standard. Uh, this is what's output by most uh, human image scanners. Um, DICOM files have a lot of metadata. So they'll have all kinds of information about scanner parameters. They'll have patient information. Um, they'll also have all, all kinds of geometrical data. 
Um, the DICOM is also inherently sort of a 2D format. So if you ever look at a DICOM uh, from a CD that you get out of an MRI scanner, there's sometimes hundreds of individual files, uh, each file representing just a two-dimensional slice from um, a three-dimensional image. And that gives it a lot of flexibility, so it can represent you know, 2D ultrasound scans uh, and, and all kinds of, you know, it can also be used to represent four-dimensional data. Um, but it also makes it a little bit more complex to work with because it's so flexible, it's so broad. So as I said, 3D images can be represented as a sequence of 2D images. Um, DICOM is not very efficient for storing derived data. So we almost never, at least in our research group, do some kind of analysis and store the result as a DICOM file. So if I want to segment liver, I'm not going to save that liver segmentation as a DICOM file. Or if I want to you know, compute a t-statistic map, uh, I'm not going to save it as DICOM unless I have to send it back to the clinicians uh, who can only view DICOM. Uh, the other issue with DICOM is that they include all this metadata, and in research we don't want to risk forgetting to anonymize it and, you know, working with files that have uh, patient names and other HIPAA-protected information. So a lot of times uh, DICOM serves as our input, but we want to convert it to a different format for the analysis. And so um, here uh, I'd recommend there's a, a tool called DICOM to NII, that's a very uh, powerful converter from DICOM to the NIFTY format, which is the next format I'll talk about. So NIFTY, uh, at least, would like to be the standard for research, for medical imaging research. Um, it was originally defined for neuroimaging, so it's a neuroimaging. The NI stands there for neuro, but uh, it really has been used in other types of imaging as well, not, not just in the brain. So NIFTY is inherently um, 3D format, so it represents 3D images as a single file, but it can also, it also has the ability to represent uh, four-dimensional images, so 3D plus time, or 3D images where you have multiple measurements per voxel uh, effectively. It has um, a very small header, so it has limited metadata, which is primarily uh, focused on geometrical information, so it stores the spatial extent and orientation. There's some flags to indicate what the intention of the file is, if it's an anatomical image, or if it's a segmentation, or if it's a t-statistic map. Um, it is does not include a lot of patient identifiers, and is very good for storing derived data. Um, most modern image analysis tools are going to understand the NIFTY format. So really, um, my recommendation is I mean, working with ITK SNAP, save all your results as NIFTY files. It's just the most flexible format. Um, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll have no problems working, interoperating with other tools. Whereas if some of the older formats, uh, we run into problems in operating with other tools where you load an image, in SNAP, you load it in another tool and coordinates will be flipped or something like that. It almost never happens with NIFTY. But we do support uh, something like 13 image formats, uh, a couple of the more common ones, um, meta image and analyze. Uh, you see a lot of these images out uh, in public data databases. And analyze is kind of a predecessor to NIFTY, so they share. There's a lot of commonalities in the two formats, but NIFTY has more richer, a um, little bit richer metadata, better geometrical uh, metadata representation. Okay, so I talked about generally images. Now I want to talk about how we represent segmentations in ITK SNAP. And this is um, one thing that I think when, when uh, people trace structures uh, in ITK SNAP, uh, sometimes um, get a little confused about is segmentations are not represented as sort of tracings. Like if you went into uh, PowerPoint or Photoshop and you wanted to, to outline it, to trace a face, that would be represented as sort of a series of points as a polygon or a curve or a spline. That's not how ITK SNAP represents segmentations. 
you do use a polygon to sort of trace something, but as soon as you trace it, it gets converted into this image-based representation of a segmentation. So in ITK Snap, segmentations are represented by images. So every voxel in the original image has a corresponding voxel in a segmentation image. And that voxel in the segmentation image is going to be assigned a label, an integer value. So it might be 0 for the background, 1 for kidney, 2 for bone, 5 for liver, something like that. But essentially the process of segmentation in ITK SNAP involves going from a an atomical image which has these different intensity levels at different voxels and assigning to every voxel a numerical label. And so once you're done segmenting, you have to take that segmentation and save it as an image file. It's going to have the same dimensions, the same voxel size, the same orientation as the anatomical file. And um, as it says here, we recommend saving those as a nifty image format. <coughs> So the uh, downside of this uh, representation is that you can't have segmentations that are more detailed than your images are to begin with. So you know this uh, example here, if you know if you have a four by four anatomical image, four by four by three anatomical image, the segmentation can also only be uh, four by four. I can't sort of trace somewhere in between. Uh, the voxel says 12 and the, ve the voxel says 234. I can't attain that level of detail, which you could do if you were doing it in Photoshop. So the way you can address this is by uh, super sampling your input image. If you really need a segmentation that's finer than your input image, just divide every one of those voxels by 8, by 2 by 2 by 2, and then segment that image instead. Um, and then you can get finer resolution in your segmentation. So um, another thing we have to realize is that when we're saving the segmentation, we not only have to save this volume that has the different numbers and different voxels, we also have to save some information about what these different numbers mean. And so in addition to storing a segmentation nifty file or segmentation image file, we save a separate small a label description file which says which, what is the anatomical meaning of each label, and also um, some information about the color that we assign to that label, um, and the opacity of that label, etc. So when we're saving segmentations, we really have to worry about the data. We can think of these label descriptions being kind of metadata, but it's not the kind of metadata we can put into the image file itself. It has to be stored in a separate file. So in addition to being able to um, display and edit segmentations, ITK Snap allows you to load overlays. And overlays are just other images. Usually they're going to be images of the same subject that you can load on top of the initial anatomical image. So in this example here, uh, the grayscale image that's uh, kind of hard to see in the background is a T1 weighted MRI scan. And the color image is a color representation of principal direction of diffusion, which is obtained from a diffusion-weighted MRI scan. And so these are, on disk, these are stored as two different uh, three-dimensional images, again, in nifty format. But we load one, then we load the other one. And we can change the uh, transparency of the overlay so that you can sort of see some of the overlay and some of the image underneath. And we'll, uh, we'll talk about how to do that. You can also do this uh, with derived information. So for example, again, if you do some kind of statistics, um, let's say you compute uh, a thickness map. So there are tools out there that will take a T1 weighted MRI scan and compute uh, the thickness of the cortex and give you a probability map, or, I'm sorry, a thickness map, a you know, value in millimeters of how thick the cortex is. It's something that you could then load into ITK Snap as an overlay and uh, view it on top of your original image. And it might, you know, you, you could just view it or you could use it to help your segmentation or you, 
you know, measure something about it, etc. So, um, so these overlays um, and the segmentation image, they're all treated as layers in ITK Snap. So, uh, similar to how you might see in, in Photoshop, you know, the different sort of you have a, a canvas in which you put different layers. So at the bottom, there's always this main image, which can be either a grayscale image or a color red, green, and blue channel image. Now in the new version that we're working on now, there's more flexibility as to what main images can be. They can be four-dimensional images. But right now it can either be a three-dimensional grayscale image or a three-dimensional three-component RGB image. You can have um, any number of overlays, and on top of all that sits the segmentation image. And so the main image is going to represent anatomy. Overlays represent either other anatomical modalities or analysis results. And the other important distinction is the main image and the overlays are typically read-only. We don't edit them. There are a couple operations that we might apply to them like change some header information. But generally speaking, we, we're not going to be changing the intensities of the main image or the overlay image. We're just going to be, we, we can change how they're displayed, how, you know, where, uh, how we view them, but we're not editing them. So what we're editing is always the segmentation image. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. So when we talk about saving something, you know, we're typically going to be saving the segmentation information. Okay, so that that um, is it for this kind of introductory theoretical part, and just summarize that ITK Snap is best suited for automatic segmentation of structures. Uh, actually, I didn't talk about this. But structures that have good intensity contrast with their surroundings. Um, that individual structures. It's good for manual segmentation or touch-up uh, when other automatic methods fail. And that it, we represent images always as three-dimensional arrays um, that are accompanied by metadata that describe the organization of the 3D array and related to physical scanner environment and the subject. <coughs> we support many image formats, but we recommend working with Nifty. And there are three types of image layers, main image, overlays, and the segmentation layer. Okay, so that's it for this.